Hey guys, it's me, Jack, and I'm back with another review. Well, it's time to wrap up the Spider-Man reviews. With my review of the 2018 animated movie, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. I remember seeing the trailer for this movie, and I was skeptical. A Spider-Man animated movie about different versions of the character from parallel universes coming together. I figured this could either be really good or really bad. But then, before the movie had even come out, I heard everybody raving about it. That is, everybody who had seen an advanced screening of it. So I figured I had to see it. So I went to go see it opening day. And what did I think? Well, I'll tell you after the story. The film centers around a young boy named Miles Morales, who is once again bitten by a radioactive spider. Oh my god, do we really have to go through this again? But then, a villain named Kingpin, using a device called the Collider, opens up the multiverse, bringing several different versions of the character from different universes into this world, including a Spider-Woman, a disgruntled Spider-Man, a noir Spider-Man, an anime Spider-Man, and even a Spider-Pig. Insert Simpsons joke here. Together, they have to stop Kingpin from destroying the multiverse with his machine. I just gotta say, I think it's amazing that I live in a universe where my favorite Spider-Man movie is the one with a pig. This movie is amazing. Not only from a story and character perspective, but also just from a visual perspective. This is one of the most visually striking animated movies I've ever seen. It truly is the comics come to life. All the characters look like they were drawn first and then put into a computer. It's very much the perfect combination of hand-drawn and CG animation. The way that the city looks, both at daytime and at nighttime, is incredible. During the day, it's very bright and colorful, very much like the classic old comic books. But at nighttime, it's very dark and mysterious, very much like a graphic novel. Sometimes the art style of the movie even resembles a painting, particularly the chase scene in the forest, and the following scene where Kingpin flashes back to the death of his family. The movie makes great use of the text bubbles as well. Whenever we hear Miles talking in his head, these text bubbles keep popping up. There's even a scene where Peter B. Parker is coming up with a plan, and we literally see that plan play out through a comic book. This really is the closest that a movie has come to capturing a comic book on screen. Aside from that, however, the movie's story and characters are great as well. Miles Morales is a great new interpretation of the character of Spider-Man. There already is a Spider-Man in this universe. Miles is just a boy going to school. He has a very relatable problem. Unlike Peter Parker, who was bullied and was a social outcast, Miles' problems stem more from his relationship with his father, who wants him to go to a school that he doesn't really like. Miles is much closer to his uncle than his father. Eventually, he is of course bitten by a radioactive spider. He starts to feel different, and he thinks that it's puberty at first. <laughs> this is one of many hilarious jokes in this movie. One night, he catches Spider-Man fighting against Kingpin and his goons. Spider-Man realizes that Miles has the same powers as him. We are then led to think that Spider-Man will train Miles and teach him the ways of being a superhero. But then, something happens. Spider-Man is killed. I gotta say, this was a great surprise. Especially seeing how in the opening, Spider-Man says that no matter how many times he gets hit, he still manages to get up. But now, he's finally been taken down. And it's up to Miles to finish this on his own. Well, that might not be the case, as he comes across a bunch of other Spider-Man characters. Miles has trouble fitting in, however, as he is unable to control his powers. It doesn't get any easier when he finds out that his uncle, who he looked up to, was working for Kingpin the whole time. And the moment where he reveals to his uncle that it's him is truly emotional. His uncle is naturally unsure about this, and in the end, he can't do it, which results in Kingpin murdering him in cold blood. Just like in the other movies, Spider-Man loses his uncle, but the context surrounding it is different. In his last moments, his uncle apologizes for disappointing him. His father also finds him dead, and this is what persuades him to go and talk to Miles, as he doesn't want him and Miles to grow apart like him and his brother did. In this moment, his father accepts him for who he is, 
and tells him that he can do whatever he wants with his life, and that no matter what he chooses, he'll be amazing. And this is what finally allows him to be able to control his powers, and become Spider-Man. And this moment is truly epic. In the climax, he is ultimately the one to stay behind, so that all the other Spider-People can go back to their universes. And despite constantly getting beaten by Kingpin, he still manages to fight back and ultimately win. This is a true hero. No matter how many times you knock them down, they keep getting up until they win. There's also Peter B. Parker, a more washed out version of the character. This Peter is a lot more cynical, considering that he's been through a lot. He falls into a depression and essentially becomes a bum. He's a very interesting new version of the character. The chemistry between him and Miles is superb, and it is very satisfying at the end to see him finally clean himself up. There's the character of Gwen, who is also Spider-Woman. The thing that I like about her is that while she is a very strong character, she is also very awkward. The scenes between her and Miles are hilarious. There's the noir version of Spider-Man, who's voiced by Nicolas Cage, and he's about as funny as you'd expect him to be, always being incredibly serious about everything. There's Penny Parker, the anime version of Spider-Man, and then there's Peter Porker, or Spider-Ham. Huh, so he's not Spider-Pig. And he is, well, a cartoon character, right down to his last line being, that's all, folks. These characters are very funny. Admittedly, they aren't as interesting as our main leads, but they are still very funny and very entertaining. And it's just great to see so many different interpretations of the character of Spider-Man. There's Miles' uncle, Aaron, who plays a similar role to Uncle Ben from the original Spider-Man story. But in a nice twist, he doesn't end up being the person that Miles thinks he is. Which is a very refreshing twist. In all the previous versions, Uncle Ben is always right. He's the perfect role model for Peter to follow. But here, no. He's actually kind of a bad guy. Not kind of, he is a bad guy. He seems a lot more like a father to Miles than, well, his actual father. So later, when his true allegiance is revealed, you're just as shocked and as heartbroken as Miles is. Of course, there's the villain, Kingpin. And holy shit, that man is enormous. I really do wonder, how does that man fit into a bathroom stall without breaking it? That is one little nitpick that I do have. Still, he is a good villain. Very intimidating. And because he's so enormous, whenever he punches or kicks somebody, you just feel the pain. When he kills Spider-Man, you feel the weight of this man's fists crashing down on him. He has no problem killing anyone, not even one of his own goons. Despite this, however, he is still not pure evil. He does have an understandable motivation. His family was killed in a car crash, and he wants to use the Collider to bring them back in some form. We even get a female version of Doc Ock, which is a great surprise. When you first meet this woman, you just assume that she's going to be a scientist that helps Kingpin. But then when she reveals her name to be Olivia Octavius, and she reveals her tentacles, oh boy. This film does do a very good job of balancing multiple villains. Again, unlike something like Spider-Man 3, where the villains felt so disconnected from each other, here they're all working together towards the same goal. Or at least, a similar goal. Kingpin wants to bring his family back, and Doc Ock wants to prove that her machine works. Even Aunt May's character is different in this version. She's a lot stronger, and unlike in the other movies, she knows everything that's going on. The film just has so much attention to detail put into every frame. There are so many little cameos and easter eggs that you notice more and more the more you watch it. There are plenty of videos dedicated to talking about this stuff, so I won't talk about it too much here. But it gives the film a lot of rewatchability. The action scenes are incredibly fast and exciting. Because this is the only animated Spider-Man movie that we've got so far, the action scenes in this film feel so much more distinct from the ones in the live action movies. Because animation allows characters to move much faster than in real life, the action scenes are just that. From the chase scene in the forest, to the fight in Aunt May's house, and the climax, which has some of the most beautiful visuals I've ever seen in an animated movie, and some of the best colors as well. The soundtrack for this movie is also very good. I mean, you've got the typical uplifting, triumphant music, but you also got a lot of great rap and hip-hop music that plays throughout the movie. My personal favorite is What's Up Danger, which plays over the scene where Miles truly becomes Spider-Man. 
The theme music for The Prowler is also very unsettling, as it's a great combination of music and this truly horrifying sound, giving The Prowler so much presence whenever he's on screen. The movie also pays great tribute to the other Spider-Man movies, particularly the Raimi movies, especially in the opening. There's a scene where Spider-Man saves a train, a scene where Doc Ock throws a car at him while he's in a cafe, and even a scene where he's dancing around on the street. And the movie itself acknowledges that this isn't something that we should talk about. I like a movie that does that. I do have a couple problems with this movie, and I'll talk about them. My first one would be that a couple of the songs that they use don't really fit the scenes that they're in, particularly the one that plays after Spider-Man is killed. It just feels kind of cheesy, and takes away from the emotional weight that the scene should have. Maybe if the music was a little bit more calm, a little bit more sad. As is, though, this just feels very out of place. My only other real problem would be that the other spider people, aside from Peter B. and Gwen, don't get as much screen time as I wanted. I wish they could have been introduced maybe a little bit earlier, or maybe the movie could have been just a bit longer. Granted, I know it's an animated movie, and animated movies shouldn't be too long, but they're just such fun characters, and for me at least, I wish they would have gotten a bit more screen time. But other than that, this movie is great. The animation, the characters, the emotion, and did I mention the animation? The animation is amazing. Everything is just so good. If someone went back in time and told the younger version of me that in the future this would be my favorite Spider-Man movie, I would have looked at them like they were from another planet. But that's the universe that we live in. I'm gonna give Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse a 9 out of 10. And so ends my Spider-Man reviews. Thank you all so much for joining me, and be sure to let me know what your thoughts are on the Spider-Man movies in the comment section down below. Give me your rankings of them from best to worst. Till then, I'm Jack, and I will see you next time.